Su casa era infinita, de distancias y silencios, entre ventanas y murallas, entre las que serán y las que ya no estaban. Ella se perdía en las islas, apenas se encontraba a sí misma. Pero sola no estaba, otros secos llamaban a ver más allá los mundos al interior. Así fue como un día abrió la puerta entreabierta y se volvió otras historias en una constelación. Décimo primera versión Festival Cine de Mujeres. Gratuito y digital. Del 23 al 28 de marzo. FemCine 11. Cine que reúne. Actividades de formación. ¿Cómo están todos, todas, todes? Bienvenidos a esta nueva actividad de FemCine 11. Y como hacemos en nuestro festival, buscamos espacios eh, que puedan ser útiles para ustedes, eh, quienes eh, son parte de nuestro festival, quienes están buscando espacios de desarrollo, y claramente en la última década el mundo de las plataformas, del pay-per-view, de las series, de la televisión que, que, que está desarrollando un nivel de calidad tremendo, es eh, cada vez más importante y un espacio de desarrollo significativo para los realizadores y realizadoras. ¿Qué pasa detrás de cámara? ¿Quiénes son las personas responsables de hacer esas series? ¿Y qué pasa con el mundo de las mujeres ahí? Bueno, tenemos la suerte hoy día de poder contar con una mujer que ha sido tres veces escogida como eh, la mujer más poderosa del cable eh, por... Eh, la eh, Cable Fax, que se llama este premio, ¿no? Mujeres más poderosas en el cable. Ella es super en la calle, ella eh, está liderando eh, la expansión internacional de los servicios y canales digitales y lineales de la marca Stars, que también tiene su plataforma funcionando para nuestro país. Ella ha trabajado para clientes como Stars, Lionsgate, CBS, Showtime, trabajó por 16 años en Sony Pictures Television y tiene una larguísima currículum muy importante como vicepresidenta senior y gerente general de redes en eh, televisión. Así que tenemos muchas preguntas para ella sobre cómo llegó hasta ahí y cuáles son su mirada respecto a las mujeres en este ámbito. Superna, thanks so much for having this time for Femcine. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to talk to you. It's a, uh, it's, uh, um, I'll say, a special occasion when you get to know a powerful woman in a powerful place in television. So my first question will be, how did you get there? In what moment of your life you de you decide, I want to work in television, but I want to work as an executive? How did you get there? Good question. Um, I actually didn't know what I wanted to do for a very long time. And so like a lot of people um, back in the day, I decided to go, I ended up going into investment banking right out of college and uh, very quickly realized that was not for me. And so I decided to go to business school to kind of reinvent myself and figure out what it is I wanted to do. And it was my husband who pointed out to me that when I opened the newspaper or the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times, because we lived in New York, um, what I turned to always is first was the entertainment pages always. And so that, um, he kind of had to point out my own interests, which was true. And I didn't really know that you could have a career in entertainment in any real way, as much as I loved it, because I didn't think anybody was gonna pay me to watch TV all day, really. That's impossible. <laughs> um, and so I didn't really understand that there was a whole business side to the business, to the, to the industry, until I went to business school and kind of figured it out. Um, and it really was an important, Um, I guess, risk to take. Um, I graduated at a time where investment banking jobs were very plentiful. Entertainment was not really interested in too many MBAs, but um, Sony Pictures at one particular year, the only year they ever went recruiting onto campuses for, for, uh, for junior executives was, was the year I graduated from business school. And I was lucky enough to be 
uh, hired along with one other young lady. And, um, you know, I really pursued it pretty extensively in that I didn't have a lot of contacts in entertainment, but I really wanted it. And so I just kept in touch with the Sony people, even though they were going back and forth, whether they were gonna hire anybody. But I really was, was very, very pers persistent, almost annoying even. Um, and so I ended up getting the job at Sony and learning the business from the ground up uh, right out of business school. Well, you has given us already a lesson to learn. We need to be persistent <laughs> and we need to go for it when we have a dream. Uh, probably for most of us, the idea of a, a television executive come from television, actually, and <laughs> for movies. Can you help us to understand what a executive, a television uh, maker, a showrunner or whatever, what, what do you do in daily basis? So I am not a showrunner, right? Because one of the things I realized was that I have no actual skills. I can't act, I can't sing, I can't dance. I did not go to film school to learn to be a producer or a director. So what is my, what can I do? Um, and so what I can do and what I do do is I run businesses and we hire and commission shows where we have a team that looks for the best content out there. And what we look for specifically are showrunners with a pedigree, we look for um, certainly women showrunners is critical to us as a company without question. That's a big part of our DNA. Um, and we look for stories that are authentic and bringing them to life is, is a joy to, to really behold. And so we look for writers and we look for executives across the board that are native to the particular country in which we're working. So we do not hire someone who, um, you know, my whole team is filled with people who are natives from you know, from Argentina, from Chile, actually, um, from all over the world, actually, based on, you know, the, the amount of countries that we're in. And so it's very important that we have authenticity throughout every single part of, of the business, whether that's from my level, running the business, all the way down to the people that are picking the content in which to nurture. Mm -hmm. And so authenticity, I think, is a really critical piece of what we do. And so when we find showrunners that have worked on other things that we've liked before, or in the case of Stars, in particular, Stars has done an amazing job getting first-time showrunners, like Tori Hall with Key Valley is an example of that, um, or Tanya Sriracha of Vida. You know, those are those are risks that we as a company take, and I think that they've paid off incredibly well. And so, on the Stars Play side of the business, which is the international business that I run, we're doing the same thing, where we're working with with people straight from you know the authenticity of the voices that that comes through completely. We will go back to that authenticity and what you are looking for as, a, as an executive. But uh, I want to come back to something that you said, uh, and we will also go with uh, the take the lead and the view that STARS has as a company for having people of color and women working with you. But before that, you are a decision maker. Yeah. And historically, decision maker has been male white and powerful and i'm i'm guessing when you started it wasn't so easy for a woman so can you share with us what's uh, what were the difficulties uh, the challenge that you uh, were confronted with uh, while you were having a place for yourself in in this business you know, when I started um, in the business, um, and even today in a lot of instances, I'm often the only woman in the room. I'm often the only woman of color, for sure, without question in a room. It's, it's a very normal experience. And I think over the years, what I've learned is that you just have to work harder. And it is as simple as that. I have, I can honestly say that myself and my other colleagues, women of color, we work hard. And we have we've always had to work really hard from the beginning, outwork the others know our stuff better than others um and it's really the only way around it because you know who's going to listen to to uh, a Saperna Kale with a funny name versus a Dan Brown you know it, it, it I made that up but you know what I mean um and so it, I think it's it's an important piece that you have to know your stuff better than anybody else and prove that you're willing to work really hard harder in a lot of instances because at the end of the day, I mean, there's this great graphic that I love where it's a white male and a, a woman of color at the, fit, at the start of a race. And I'm sure you've seen this, but I'm obsessed with it. Um, you know, at the end is the finish line. It's the same distance, but in between here for the women 
uh, there's, you know, a shark that's reaching out to get her or something else to trip her or a bomb going off or whatever it might be. And there's a lot of hurdles to get to the exact same place. And it's a zig and a zag. It's not a straight line. And I think that that just identifies our experience. And so I've never been one who's shy to speak in meetings, even when I'm not welcome. I'm very persistent. Um, there's no question I am pretty tenacious um, when I when I feel that, you know, we need to do something better. But I think executive courage is another thing that's really important where I will lean into things that are hard and things that don't, people don't necessarily want to talk about, I will go in and talk about. I don't have fear, I guess, of, of, uh, of that for whatever reason is I will, I'm from North India, Punjabi, where like the Sicilians of India, you know, like we go head first into controversy and try and find our way out afterwards. But that's, that's super powerful to hear because that goes again every teaching that women have received through <laughs> through the history, no? That we have to be quiet, that we have to be yeah. uh, soft, that we have to uh, bend, you know? And, and what you are telling us is that we don't, we have to go for it. We have to go for it, but I agree with that too, too that, you know, the, the desire for us to be softer and Um, not as aggressive as, is something that you have to balance. And I think that that is something we have to do. There's just no question. If I acted like a lot of my male colleagues, it would be a huge disaster for my career. Mm -hmm. um, there's no, there's just no way around that either. You know, there is a, a fine line that you have to walk and, you know, learning how to walk that walk is, is often hard. And it depends on who you're speaking to, you know, who your audience is um, in terms of that as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think things have have changed since uh, the Me Too movement, uh, since the Time's Up movement, uh, because we can see the productions. We can see that we have more series about women and film by women, but be behind cameras, what is going on? You know, it's a good question. Um, I've never, thankfully, experienced a lot of the Me Too or Time's Up stuff personally, you know, Um, in the exec among the executives that I've worked with, I just said it's never been an issue, frankly. But I will say that um, you know, for younger folks coming up now, younger ladies that are just starting their career right out of college or business school, I think they're going to have a much, much, much easier time where they're going to be listened to and believed and heard. And it's just there's no room for kind of misbehavior at the executive level. On productions, of course, same thing. No, no room for misbehavior at all. I think it's going to be a lot easier. I will say that. I agree with you that, that it is becoming easier, um, especially as you have more and more showrunners that are women as well, right? And more executives that are women as well. Not to say that women are completely 100%, you know, they never engage in bad behavior. Of course, there's always the case. But by and large, um, I think it's going to get, or it is getting a lot better. Uh -huh. My, my impression is that we are living in a um, cultural break, something like that. We, we are having both things going on. We have an older generation trying to say what, what is going on. They, I used to be able to do that, do this, to, to talk that, and it was okay, and nobody told me anything. And now everybody's getting so... Uh, Um, I don't know, have so much rage and, and so everybody's so pissed off for what we're doing. And how do, how do we deal with that? To, don't, to make people be bold and, and don't feel afraid of these changes? I think there's always going to be some men that are going to feel afraid of change, right? They're going to say, oh, I can't say anything to anybody anymore. I should mm -hmm. just put tape across my face because I think anything I say can and will be used against me. And I think that if you walk around thinking that way, it's probably because you're probably not a good person. You know, whereas I think your your normal executive can go about their day. There's just no point to any sexism. There's no reason to bring any of that into the into the workplace at all. You know, of course things could go too far. I and mean, there's no there's no doubt about it that you hear stories where someone says something very innocuous and it was no big deal but the executive got in trouble for, for something very silly. Of course, there's going to be extreme examples of that, but by and large, it's perfectly fine to just leave nonsense out of the office. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. 
well, well we're learning and it's, it's, a, it's a very exciting moment and probably that's why representation is so important and now i would love for you to Bernard, to talk to us about take the lead initiative what stars is doing and after that i will have some questions about representation absolutely so stars is an amazing company in that you know we from since I've been there, which has been about three years, have always really looked at women and people of color um, as an important part of the company, both from the executive side as well, all the way down into the shows that we have. And so our audience is, you know, it's it's women, first and foremost, it's African American, it's Hispanic women, uh, underserved audiences, if you will. And so you know, we are very careful in everything that we do um, in terms of making sure that people who are picking the shows are of color or women or both, um, all the way down, as I mentioned, all the way to the casting. So, you know, fully 75% of the executive suite is women. When do you ever hear that? Half of those are women of color. That's amazing. Um, and so, you know, Jeff Hirsch, our boss, has really spent a lot of time and effort really understanding who are audiences and then working all the way backwards to making sure that, again, all the way back up to the, the people picking the shows um, are representative of, of the audience. Otherwise, there's a huge disconnect where you think you're doing something and you're picking shows and, and commissioning shows and producing shows that don't actually resonate. So if you look at I mean, the two best examples I can give you are Vida and, and P Valley. Those shows are, oh my God, like nothing that's ever been on television as far as I know. And it only came about because we had the exact right showrunner and writers that really understood what it is that they were trying to craft um, in terms of they, they are the audience, if you will. And so, you know, it wasn't watered down. Those shows were not watered down. They were not put in front of 15 focus groups and changes, changes, changes. I mean, we are a premium network domestically and internationally. And we have to lean into that. And again, authenticity to me is the most important word. Why? Why representation is important? Because if our audiences are, are women, then you really need to have people who understand how to write for women. And if you are a guy writing for a woman, it's just a different experience. It would be me trying to write, you know, um, something for the French audience because I studied French in school. It wouldn't work. I, I wouldn't be able to do it. You know, um, whereas I do understand India uh, quite well, but even I'm not Indian Indian, right? I was raised outside of India. And so for me to write for an Indian audience would actually be really hard too, because I wouldn't be authentic. If you wanted me to write for an Indian American experience, I could do that, right? Yeah. I could write, you know what I mean? Um, but, uh, you know, I think, I think that's really critical that the authenticity all the way through from culture, to me, culture is king and queen. Yeah, and also I will uh, agree to that, but also uh, add that we have a view of the world through cinema, through series, especially today. It's, it's awesome. And we're in Chile. We're very far away from Hollywood. And so much of, of our daily basis view of the world has to do with what Hollywood has shown us from how to fall in love, how to be well-dressed, how to be successful and everything. Mm -hmm. And Hollywood has been such a, has had such an impact in our subjectivity, in the way that we think we can be happy. And I think that's changing. And, and probably as the woman that you, that you are talking about now are more demanding of true stories or more um, close to the experience, to the real experience. For sure. And, you know, I should mention that internationally, we are male and female. We're actually not all women focused in terms of our audience base. And so we tend to acquire a lot of shows that, you know, feed that male audience, again, with the lens of being fun and interesting and, and, and premium in every way. So we lean heavily into action and drama and thriller and sex and crime. Like that's kind of who Stars Play is abroad. And so if you look at shows like um, Normal People, which uh, we can have in Chile as well, you know, that's a show that is universal. It's about, it's two Irish kids, you know, in high school, their journey through college and then beyond college. And it's just about falling in love. And that show, you know, 
while your average Indian American or Indian or Chilean person is can't necessarily identify with their lives, they can absolutely identify with falling in love, right? And so that particular show did quite well for us in Chile, frankly, um, because it was so universal. It's love is love, right? And it brings you back to your first love, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, it just would. And so um, shows like that, again, that's a little bit more female focused, but a show like Gangs of London, which is very male focused, you know, that is a, a full on crime thriller show. Again, to your point, Hollywood does and has traditionally set that example of aspirational. Whereas I think that that's also changing that a lot of local shows, I mean, Netflix does a brilliant job of, you know, bringing stories to life from other countries. And that cross viewership is amazing. And it only works well for the rest of the streaming landscape as, you know, uh -huh. as we continue. And so, you know, one of the shows that we're gonna bring into Chile is um, the story of a Mexican um, film pageant, or sorry, uh, pageant. So it's called Senorita Mexico. Um, and so that's gonna come to Chilean audiences. And I do think that there's gonna be something again in there for everybody to be able to identify with and relate to. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, we're, we're going to be authentic to that Mexican voice um, and hope it works in Chile. Eventually we'll start to get more and more shows from all sorts of places, including um, you know, places like Chile and Argentina and Brazil. Mm -hmm. well. well, we have, we have great, filmmakers here <laughs> so but then you talk something that is a very um hard balance authenticity and universal themes no something that everybody can relate all over the world but at the same time something that you and your village can go through so for storytellers for people who is seeing this conversation right now What would be your your advice? How do you mix and balance those two things? I think that, you know, if you look at Pea Valley, um, what do I know about being in the South in a strip club? Like, I know nothing about that, but it was really interesting to watch that. And so there is a curiosity there. And why that show did so well, I keep coming back to this, is because it was not like nothing that you'd ever seen before. So there is that interest levels, sure, I don't necessarily can, I don't know that I can relate to a lot of those characters, um, nor am I from there, but the storytelling was so brilliantly and so well done, um, they, you know, I wanted to watch it. Similarly, Luca, you know, the show on Netflix, um, that uh, is the show of a detective in France. Again, not much I can relate to, but super interesting story told very cleverly, cleverly. So, you know, I think that balance, you're right, is hard to find, but not every show needs to work for everybody. That being said, it should have enough interesting elements to it, whether it's plot, location, cast, or just the, you know, the, the actual look and feel of it all um, needs to be something that works. I, I think it's so interesting because uh, Lupin, is uh, the director is a Chilean filmmaker. <laughs> He's a women filmmaker that is doing that in Paris. So it's, it's very exciting to see yeah. how, can, how can we uh, transcend uh, the, the territories uh, to tell good stories. Mm -hmm. But then I, I think it's so amazing what you're doing with uh, the Take the Lead initiative. Uh, and I want to go back to that and to the amazing numbers that you have as stars. Because that is also a challenge for the industry. You are saying, and I will go back to, to the numbers, 60, 63% of series lead on a star original series are people of color and 57.9% are women. 60% of series regular role on a star's original series are portrayed by people of color and 27% are portrayed by women of color. And I will go back to why that is so important. And I will ask you why, uh, how is the, the rest of the industry, the rest of the platforms and, and the producers uh, looking at what you're doing with Take the Lead? You know, I, it's, it's an interesting question. You know, we're definitely leap years or leap, we're, we're far ahead of our industry, no question about it. Um, and so, you know, I think at some point the industry will start to take notice of kind of what we're doing, what others are doing as well in, in terms of putting um, showrunners, 
directors, producers, et cetera, um, and, and finding those voices, you know, but it, it comes down to a lot of things. It's um, everything from, you know, when you're hiring somebody, that job description has to open and open that lens and, and open that aperture, if you will, to hire, to get more people in the door that are actually going to apply for the jobs that you have available, whether it's on a production or, or in the offices. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, I was just listening to a talk of a lady that was explaining that, you know, one of the things that they wanted to do was to hire a head of marketing at, at a particular company. Uh, they wanted a woman of color. That was their goal. And so the job description said, you know, some of your campaigns are ma will make us super envious, right? And that, that was just one small line in, in the long job description. And uh, the recruiter said, you know what? You're not gonna get people applying at the level that you want the women of color because they haven't done these campaigns that are gonna make you envious or jealous. What you really need is a person one or two rungs down that will, that have the, the, they have never been given the chance, frankly, but they're doing all the work behind the scenes. So what that job, you could switch that line to say, instead of, you know, you've done campaigns that would make us jealous to, come here and make the campaigns that'll make everybody jealous. Uh -huh. And a simple twist like that changes who you bring in the door. And that is really an important piece to learn. So it goes all the way from what you want to how you get there. And everything needs to be aligned across the company um, and the production going uh -huh. forward in terms of opening that aperture up to get more diverse people in the door who are then going to become more qualified. But the more and more we do this as a company, as an, as an industry, the better it will be for the entire ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Hiring women of color changes everything. It changes economics in the city in which you're working. It changes the type of stuff that you're doing and it changes your leadership across the board. Mm -hmm. I, I really want to stop there in the first thing that you said, the economics. Because of course here we can say, it is the morally thing to do. <laughs> It's the right thing to do. Uh, but we forgot so many times that when you hire women, you are building an economic system that helps everybody in that community. So can can you develop some uh, about that? Sure. I mean, this goes you know across. And I can. I'm an economist by training from college um but i can go into this in glorious detail but you know give a woman a dollar give a man a dollar and, and it gives much more reward to give when you give it to the woman both in poorer countries um down to micro lending to all the way up to executive um executives you know when you pay women well and you pay them equally to men it changes the economics of of everything of their household their communities um and it just it, it ripples all the way through so you're also now giving Um, money to uh, someone in childcare as well, if the woman is working outside the house full time. Um, and it, that whole thing just goes on and on and on. Yeah, it, and it's, I think it's super important also, well, because right now, because of the COVID and the pandemic moment that we're living, women, again, as the, they are the group that we have suffered more Uh, because of the pandemics. So if we want to change and have this uh, new wave of economic movement, we need to see women. And, and it's important to see women behind cameras and on cameras. And I really like what you're doing with your lead women. And because it's not enough to have a lead woman in a series or in a movie if, if you're giving her the same stereotype stereotype role that we have seen for so many decades and paying her less for it as well mm -hmm. yes yes and why why in the same of the economics point of view for stars as a as a platform has been a good um move in the economic way to have more women and women of color I think so. I think so. Yeah. I mean, we've grown so much over the past two years, three years that I've been here, you know, um, and I think it works really well for the streaming environment that we're living in. You know, Stars is no longer that linear network uh, just in the U.S. We're in 56 countries as a streaming service. Um, and, you know, I think that 
again, that ability to tell authentic voices for the demographics that we're, we're chasing is, is, is perfectly matched. Whereas um, if it were mismatched, I think you would see it in, in, the, in our economics of our company and we're very, very well. Great. That, that's, that's a good uh, news. And also I think it's g give us a lot of hope, especially to all the filmmaker of the women filmmakers that are watching this conversation. And for them, uh, Superna, will you give us some advice for women that want to be part of uh, the television, of the oh, of the cinema, just behind cameras, writing or directing, or as an executive, what would, would be your your advice? Um, hustle. You know, talk to everybody and, and, and anybody. Um, you know, I tell the story a lot that I'm actually quite introverted, but I really had to train myself to become more extroverted, and, and really, that's the only way to go after what it is you want. And so if you want to be a director, then you're going to school, I'm assuming, or you're doing an internship um, to become a director. And then you've got to knock on every single door till you find that one door that will get to find someone that will give you that chance. And that's a really hard thing to do. But again, tenacity is, is the most important thing because most of the people that I know that are actors or filmmakers behind, you know, whether they're producers or directors, they can't imagine their lives doing anything else. Similarly, I could never imagine my life or being happy as an investment banker. This is what I was meant to do and I was meant to do. And so I think similarly that passion, uh, you know, if you have it comes through in whatever it is that you're chasing. Yeah, and, male or female, frankly, but it is. Uh -huh. Yes. No question. Yes. Yeah. And that's something I, I teach in cinema school and, and that's something hard to, for the millennials and the new generations. Uh, like you go and you effort, like you have to you have to do work. the walk. <laughs> it's hard. Mm -hmm. But I will say it's a good time for for women filmmakers and, and there are more opportunities and more doors to be opened, right? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, you just have to find the right one and you have to just knock on a hundred doors till you find it. And then to close and being very, very uh, down to earth. Yeah. If someone who is looking at this conversation says, well, I have this great idea for um, for a series. Oh, I really will love to be part of a Stars Play production. What they do, how, how, how they start there? Yeah, I mean, we, you know, we look at a lot of different, um, I have a whole content team that uh, looks at shows from all over. And so, you know, the first thing to do is to get in touch and then I give it over to our content team and then they go through and decide if it's right for us. And so uh, what is right for us just from the beginning is sex, crime, thriller, violence, <laughs> any vice <laughs> we lean very heavily into. Um, so, you know, if it's within that genre, we, we are absolutely open to looking at things. Um, ideally, you know, with um, some level of packaging already done, meaning a cast, attached, script, that kind of thing. We don't buy super early at the idea stage. We don't do that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just not set up to do that. I don't have a lot of development executives in my team. Um, we tend to buy things that are a little more done. And mm -hmm. yeah. Good. So now you have uh, the information, you have the key, go to work. <laughs> super. Thanks so much for your time. Thanks for talking to Femcina. We're super excited and very thankful for your time. Thank you, Antonella. Thanks. Y cerramos con esta conversación. Muchas gracias por acompañarnos. Recuerden, todavía continúa Femcine en nuestras plataformas. Que estén muy bien.